thank you to all of you for coming to today's event, joining event with the Value University, all the development society as well. For those who don't know, my, uh, my name's Arsh, that's Tejas and Charles. Unfortunately for you guys, we run those societies. Um, today's event will be quite similar to those of last week. We'll have approximately 20 to 30 minutes of questions, time for myself, Tejas and Charles. We will then open up the floor to you guys, so you can hopefully come up with some challenging questions, which I'm sure Manish will very much enjoy answering. I won't spend too much time introducing him. He is, of course, a man that requires little to no introduction. However, he started his investment career focused on buying high-quality, growing businesses, before he then started Bright Funds in 1999, where he switched to a more very mess, deep value style of investing. He's remained managing partner of the firm, and absolutely, which has provided a staggering 781% net of fees compared to 300, 378% in the S&P in the last 22 years, so an exceptional track record. Um, in an era where so many investors have been wooed by flashy tech stocks, high-growing companies, he's remained committed to his classical value investing style, which has come from deep inspiration with Warren Buffett, who he famously had lunch with and paid $650,000 for back in 2018. Perhaps how many of us became acquainted with Manish as well. He also is a founder investor, an absolutely fantastic reader, which I'd high, an absolutely fantastic reader, which I'd highly recommend giving a look if you haven't already, which brings up the concepts of his heads I win, tells I don't lose much investment philosophy. But I won't waste too much of your guys' time, so let's give it up for a huge round of applause for Manish Pabrian. So I guess the first question we have for you, a bit of an intro, a bit of a warm-up question. You're perhaps best known for your book, The Dando Investor. Would you like to start up by giving a quick overview of the book and your inspiration you had for writing it as well? Uh, sure. So first of all, thanks for inviting me. It's uh, great to be back and uh, good to be in such August company. So that's wonderful. I actually wrote the book to crystallize some concepts in my own mind. You know, I think they say that the best way to learn is to teach. So I actually wanted to just put down on paper things I had, frameworks I had in my head, et cetera, just kind of more uh, structured, formalized format. Basically, you know, it ended up being a book and I used to basically just have a goal every day of just uh, writing one page. I just uh, sit down in the morning morning and, uh, you know, spend about an hour and then I'd go off do other things. And in about six months, the book was done, which was great. And uh, one thing I would say is that some of you might be fans of Seinfeld and Seinfeld wrote a book. It's a very good book. It's called is that something? And uh, his approach in life has been every day to sit down for a couple of hours with a yellow notepad and basically write down things he observed about humans or the human experience. And, you know, eventually these things, so, you know, he would noodle on something. I don't know if you guys remember, there was an episode of Seinfeld where they go to pick up a rental car and the person at the rental car company tells them that um, we have your reservation, but you, we don't have a car. So, you know, Seinfeld and, you know, says, well, you know, if you have the reservation, it means you have the car. I mean, that's the whole point of a reservation, right? And so again, it was these types of kind of daily kind of interactions that we have. And he would write down whatever he observed. Then he would come back the next day and again, look at uh, what he had written down and, you know, try to develop it. And most things would fall by the wayside and a few things would end up having enough meat on the bone that it could become part of a comedy routine or maybe even part of a Seinfeld episode and so on. So that discipline of, you know, sitting down every day and going about it in a very kind of scientific way really kind of set him apart from other comedians and, and such because uh, others may have been funnier or may have had better delivery or other things, but they didn't have the discipline. So this kind of set him apart and of course, made him very wealthy. Hi, Manish. I uh, just want to really ask another question about the book that you wrote, uh, The Dando Investor. Um, you have that now published 17 years ago, uh, which is a statistic you may not like to be reminded of. Uh, but it indeed came out in a time where many of us in this room were just mere infants. Um, so if you were to now write a revised edition for a new generation of investors, what was the, really the, the main message that you would like to convey across? I don't have any plans to do a second edition or anything like that. But if I were to do something, I would emphasize more the notion 
of the hundred baggers and the notion of, you know, the relentless hunt for great long-term compounders. At the end of the day, basically in an investing lifetime, if you were to were able to find even, uh, you know, two or three of those, even a couple of those with some reasonable portion of your portfolio allocated to them, you'd be done pretty much. I mean, you could have a 95% error rate and you still hit the ball out of the park or a six, I might add. And so I would kind of explore more that end of the wealth creation that is possible if one is honed in on that. Hey, Moni, so recently we've seen a lot of traditional value investors gradually shifting towards a more quality-oriented philosophy like that you just spoke of. So, for example, Guy Spear has an investment in Ferrari at 50 times earnings, but you still follow a very value-oriented approach. What is the reason for that and how come you're stuck with it? I used to own more than 1% of Ferrari. It's a deep regret I have that, you know, we're all too soon and why is too late. Basically, I didn't fully appreciate the quality of that business width and depth of that boat. So, so yeah, I mean, I think if you find yourself in the fortunate position of, and you know, I got Ferrari as part of my purchase of Fiat Chrysler about 12 years ago. And at the time, effectively, Ferrari was being valued at uh, less than 2 billion for the entire company. And it's more than like, I don't know, 20, 30 times that, maybe 25 times that today. And uh, in not that many years. Yeah, I mean, I think that I'm still always going to be trying to buy assets well below what they're worth. But one of the kind of evolutions I've gone through is to appreciate that some assets need to be held when they're fully priced and even held when they appear to be overpriced. And just to follow up on that, I think a core tenet of your investment philosophy is taking bets with outside return profiles and betting heavily on them. So finding businesses with exceptionally large margins of safety, which allows to place such large positions of your portfolio in singular companies. But given that you take such a deep value perspective, where you are looking for such fundamental valued assets, whatever emphasis do you place on evaluating the quality of management and how do you go about assessing the management? And the primary motivation I have been up behind asking that is, I think for new investors, I think determining the quality of management and whether they're you know, truly aligned with the long-term interests of a business can be exceptionally hard, especially given that they're all trained by the same PR departments and they all sort of post the same sort of dribble on their annual report. So... Yeah. I think obviously figuring out the nature of management and the competence and capabilities and how engaged they are and likely to be engaged there in the future is of fundamental importance. The prescription that Buffett and Munger have for that, which I have followed, is not to focus on what they're saying will happen in the future, but to focus on what they've said in the past and what's actually transpired in the past. So one of the things, unfortunately, most managements now don't write the annual letter or the annual report, you know, that's kind of relegated to some PR firm or the IR part of the company. But what I find useful is to go look at the earnings and other transcripts over the last several decades. So if a management team has been or CEO has been running a particular company for 10, 15, 20 years, that's uh, tremendous because then we have a a long history of they've been holding quarterly calls and so on. And a lot of that is unscripted because they don't really know what questions are going to get asked. So when they're kind of, you know, answering different questions, you know, giving their perspectives, it's not, the messaging is far less controlled. And of course, you also have you can overlay that with the actual performance of the business. You know, then basically you can apply other nuances to come up with what uh, Munger would call a lattice work of mental models. And using all of that in some situations, you may have a really good grasp of the nature of management. And in an even smaller number of cases, you may end up with finding some management teams that are truly exceptional. And maybe the world doesn't see it or recognize it because they haven't gone through that process like you. So basically, I think in the area of security analysis, digging deep. So first of all, I think there's a big decision to be made on which rabbit holes you decide to go down. So it's important to try to go down rabbit holes that you think may have some promise. But when you go down rabbit holes, which you know show some promise, and you go deep into those rabbit holes, that's likely to end up giving you a very significant competitive edge because you have a very deep understanding uh, of that business. So for example, in 2012, I'd mentioned I made an investment in Fiat Chrysler. They had brought in a person from outside the auto industry to lead Fiat Chrysler. I think he joined 
in at that time it was fiat he joined in 2004 he was the fifth ceo they had hired in two years and the company was really in very bad financial shape bleeding millions of euros every day and the banks were ready to kind of you know put the noose around them etc so he had a really tough hand dealt to him and he executed brilliantly so by the time i made the investment in fiat chrysler in 2012 there was eight years of history of sergio marchioni to look back on at fiat with a lot of transcripts and presentations and reports, financials available to kind of look at kind of what had transpired. One could also look at the whole acquisition of Chrysler. And basically, I spent about, I think, about four months digging deep. There was a book on the Agnellis and there was some Harvard case studies on Sergio. So I realized that this was a business. It was a tough business, but this was a business run by a truly once in a generation manager, which most of the other market participants didn't, didn't appreciate. And the second thing was, it was a business which was doing about 130 or 140 billion in sales with a five or $6 billion market cap. They had some products and brands that were alone capable of producing five, six billion a year. Like the Jeep franchise could easily produce that. The Ram franchise, which doesn't exist in the UK, could easily produce that. And so one had to just get rid of some of the non-performing pieces and you would have a company making about 10 billion a year. So basically that came about after, you know, digging into Sergio and digging into the business and so on. So I think, like I said, the data set is too large. Going down promising rabbit holes is important. If you go down a rabbit hole that you think is promising and then appears to be not so promising, you need to back out and go into the next rabbit hole. You know, I just thought it'd be worth perhaps following up on the, the point you just made then. Um, you spoke at quite long length about fiat. Uh, obviously now Fiat has been packaged up in a, a new business now, Stellantis, which is uh, trading at three times forward earnings. Um, I'm curious, do you have a view on the business? Do you think it'd be quite a good value opportunity if you were to try to uh, take back a similar thesis that you previously made? I don't want this to be about stock tips, but I'll give you some perspectives. I don't have any ownership in Stellantis. It is being run by a gifted manager. Carlos Tavares is a great manager. He can squeeze blood out of a rock. He buys $200 suits and he's happy when he's visiting the different fiat plants, et cetera, to have a, you know, $3 sandwich for lunch. And uh, he's a pretty no nonsense guy. So if the game is about squeezing efficiencies, Carlos is your man. He's truly exceptional at it. On the weekends, he's a race car driver. You know, he's on the track, so he loves the auto business in general. I think the difference now versus when I was looking in 2012 is that we have the looming transition to EVs, electric vehicles. That transition is a very expensive transition for the legacy auto manufacturers like Stellantis, tens of billions in CapEx. And you got to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with two Mavericks. You got to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Elon, and you got to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Cheng Fu Wang at BYD in China. And my perspective is that if you find yourself in the unhappy situation of having to compete with Elon, just go find something else to do. Just take your ball and leave the arena. Do not try to compete with Elon. Do not pass go and do not collect 200. It's bad for your health and definitely bad for your wealth. And there's only one guy Elon is afraid of, and that's Cheng Fu Wang in China. And Cheng Fu Wang runs BYD. And, you know, the Indian guy who's talking to you had the good pleasure of meeting Cheng Fu Wang a few times. And BYD is a company in China, which Berkshire Hathaway has a maybe a 7 8% interest in. And when Charlie Munger was in 2008 trying to get Warren Buffett interested in investing in BYD. Warren had no interest in investing in some Chinese company he'd never heard of and, you know, didn't want to do the work. So he just told Charlie, I'm not interested. So Charlie told Warren, Warren, this guy is the second coming of Henry Ford. And Warren said, Charlie, I'm still not interested. So then Charlie told Warren, he is Henry Ford and Bill Gates in the same person. And Warren said, well, that's good, Charlie, but I'm still not interested. So then Charlie told him, Warren, he's Henry Ford 
and Bill Gates and Thomas Edison in the same person. And then what Warren did is he owned 80% of a company called Mid-American Energy, which was, you know, majority controlled by Berkshire. And he asked them to put 250 million into BYD getting about an 8 or 9% stake, which has gone up, I don't know, 20 or 25 fold at this point. So the only person who gives Elon pause is Chung Fu Wang. And even if you're Carlos Tavares, and when you have to go toe to toe, not just with Elon, but with Elon and Elon squared, you know, when you have Elon plus Elon squared, just definitely don't be in the same arena. It's not going to work even if it's just Elon. So the Lantus is very cheap. It's very well run. If there was no EV transitions, things would be fine. Now, the other problem is that if Elon and Elon squared make a 10% margin on the EVs that they sell, Stellantis and Ford and GM are going to lose money because their cost advantage is more than 10%. And if you have a business, so we, let's fast forward to a world where there's no combustion engine cars being sold as new cars. They're only electric vehicles sold, maybe 15 years from now or 20 years from now. And you have a negative margin and Elon and Elon squared are making 10%. Well, at a negative margin, the business has no value. So it, to me, falls into what Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett would call the too hard pile. So I just put it into the too hard pile and move on. You mentioned in previous interviews that you've had the pleasure of having dinner with Charlie many times and even playing bridge occasionally with him. In meeting and talking to him, what did you learn from him and what did you learn about him that think made him such a great investor? Well, Warren and Charlie have been such open books over their lives that pretty much anything you want to learn from them, know about them, is in the public domain. They've been they've both been very generous and exceptional teachers. So if you wanted to learn from Charlie Munger, which I think is a very good exercise, it's really simple. First, there's a great book called Poor Charlie's Almanac. If you bought that book, it might cost you 50 or $75. And if you read that book carefully, you would unfortunately get more out of that book and be wiser than the years at LSE. And LSE, unfortunately, for the years that you're spending here, is charging you slightly more than $75. Maybe you can educate me how much more than $75 is costing you to be there. But poor Charlie's Almanac would run circles around what the esteemed professor at LSE have to teach. Then you could overlay that with the Berkshire meetings. Buffett.cnbc.com is where the last 28 years or so of annual meetings or 29 years of annual meetings are archived, six hours each. And in this case, you don't have to spend the $75, it's zero. So it's even a better deal than poor Charlie's Almanac. And so you get like 150 hours of Buffett and Munger talking to you and charging you nothing. And again, slightly better economics than LSE. So in my interactions with Charlie, I think what I, some of the things I kind of gleaned from him, which maybe were not, you know, directly in the public domain, was his focus on the problem at hand. So I used to repeatedly remind Charlie about the huge body of work, of great work he had produced in his lifetime and the huge impact he had had on humanity and capitalism and so on. And he just brushed it off. He never wanted to spend time uh, thinking about that or talking about that or any of that. All his energies were focused on issue in front of him. So he would repeatedly tell him, tell me that, you know, Berkshire has all this cash. We can't find a good place to put it to work. And he would moan and groan about that. And I'd always tell him, Charlie, you guys always find a way. So don't worry, it's going to happen. And uh, then one time he was, uh, you know, looking for a CEO at Daily Journal, uh, one of the public companies he was a chairman of. And he was totally focused on that. So he didn't really care about so many of the things that he had accomplished. I realize a lot of us humans, you know, we go to elite institutions, we work at some great places, we might start a business, we might do well. We look back and we say, oh, you know, well done, Monish. That's been a good job. Well done. And, you know, that takes away from the focus. So I learned that, you know, keep your nose to the grindstone. Focus on the problem at hand. 
do not be satisfied by what has transpired in the past and continue to move the ball down the field. So those are some of the lessons I took from Charlie. More, uh, most of what I learned from him was not so much the direct words he spoke to me. It was just observing him, you know, just observing him in close quarters with, in his home, with his daughter-in-law or with his grandkids and that sort of thing. Just observing him with his kids and grandkids, partners and different people he was interacting with. I think one of the greatest things about the value of investing community is we have access to so many great teachers like yourself who publish so much literature for us to read. Yet despite all of that, you know, cloning investment strategies is exceptionally difficult. What, what, is it, what is it about cloning strategies do you think that makes it so difficult and what do you think we can do better? Obviously, you describe yourself as a shameless cloner and someone who's taken so much inspiration from Buffett. So what sort of things did you do to be able to, you know, gain the sort of thought processes that Buffett uses? So what do you think that we can do better to be able to clone the investment strategies of many of the investment grades that they teach us? Yeah, so I think one of the problems in investing is that the data set is too large. We have 50,000 stocks around the planet. Each is a rabbit hole. And each rabbit hole that you might want to go down might take a few days to a few months to really get your arms around. A lot of these rabbit holes are not even in your circle of competence. So even if you went down them, you would not understand them. So there is a need to get some shortcuts and cut that data set down dramatically. One of the shortcuts you can use to cut that data set down is to be a shameless cloner. Don't just be a cloner, be a shameless cloner like me. So basically, if you have understood how some investors invest, how their minds work, et cetera, they usually have to make filings in various geographies around the world disclosing what they have. And they don't want to do that, but they have to do that. And so if you understand the investor, you see what kind of position you, uh, they have and you, uh, you like the way they approach things and they have a good track record, well, that can cut your data set down by more than 99%. You might be able to take a 50,000 stock universe down to maybe 50 stocks or less, maybe 20 stocks, and then start going down those rabbit holes. So cloning can be a really good way to trim the data set, but you still have to do the work and you still have to figure out whether it's something that's within your circle of competence and whether you can understand the business well enough and whether there's a big delta between price and value once you've understood the business. You made quite the controversy recently with your bet on coal with Alpha Metallurgical Resources and Console Energy. Do you think that in the... In light of the onset of ESG, that buying out of fashion companies will continue to yield positive returns for value investors? Now we are getting to things which are, you know, current positions in the portfolio. And I really prefer not to talk much about the current positions in the portfolio. We might still be buying them. We don't need competition. But I would say in general that coal, when you get all the, you know, ESG and ESG pressures and different things, I mean, a lot of like US foundations and endowments will not allow the managers that they invest in to own these stocks, which is actually quite irrational because we wouldn't have a civilization if we suddenly shut down met coal mining or for that matter, even thermal coal mining. So the state of the world today is that if we try to satisfy our energy needs with solar and wind and nuclear, we'd have some really cold nights and we'd have some pretty dark homes. And definitely all the AI computers, which are massive power hogs, couldn't be kept alive. So the reality is for base loads, and I'm talking about thermal coal, but for base loads, humanity will have a dependency on thermal coal for some time. Thermal coal consumption is going down in the US, it's going down in Europe. It's still on the rise in places like India, and it's very much required for quite some time to have a civilization. Metallurgical coal, which is used to produce iron and steel, has no practical substitute. So if you want to try to have a civilization without iron and steel, it wouldn't be much of a civilization. So on the metallurgical coal side, the need is a mandatory need, and there are no real substitutes for it. 
And that's all I have to say about the coal business. I would love to talk more about it if and when at some point we have no ownership in these names and you guys still have a deep interest in talking about it. Yeah, I think really just the final question from us three uh, before we open up to the audience. Uh, I'm sure there's many people very versed to ask uh, Manish some good questions. Um, I think just finally, uh, I mean, being as investment societies, we're all uh, very keen in practical advice. Uh, so we wondered perhaps you could just talk about almost the process which you go through from uh, initially coming across the business through to then getting conviction. Yeah, I mean, I think the the very first question I ask myself when I run into some business, uh, you know, let's say I see some company on the 13F of some investor I admire, is the first question I ask, is it within my circle of competence? And a lot of businesses are wiped out when I ask that question. Now, if the business happens to be in my circle of competence, then I ask the second question, is it widely mispriced? I'm not really interested in something that's selling for $75 a share and is worth $100 a share. That is too Mickey Mouse for me, you know? So what I'm looking for is it's selling for $75 a share and maybe it's worth 300 or 400 or 500 a share or more. So the second question I ask myself is, does there appear to be a very large gap between price and value? And of course, you know, the world's a competitive place. So in most cases, for the second question, the answer is going to be no. But sometimes the answer might come out, yes, does appear to be a pretty large gap. And then I say, okay, let's go down the rabbit hole. And, you know, let's try to understand the business better and what it's about and what it's likely to look like in five or 10 years and, you know, what we might be able to make if you own it and so on. And so that's the process. So now I'll open the floor to questions from you guys. I'm sure you guys are very keen. So, yeah, any questions you guys might have? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, she does. Yeah. Uh, hi, Manish. Uh, my question is, as we are young and only uh, many of us are only graduating, what would be your, at least one of recommended paths of starting a job or an investing career um, to not to be stuck in some career that won't lead us to, uh, for example, being an investor, but that would teach us skills that would could be utilized in the future. Yeah, I think if you have an interest in being a professional investor, I would suggest that you should create a you know a very separate brokerage account from where you don't write, you know, checks for your groceries or, you know, withdraw funds through a debit card or something like that. Something where the track record could easily be audited in five or 10 years. So you put money in, you invest it, and then you look at what those returns are after five, 10, 15 years. And if those returns are significantly above the index, then you have some basis to think about asking other people to give you money. But you would need some kind of track record that warrants that. I would get that going as early as possible. Size of the account is not that relevant. I think having the discipline that it's you know clearly auditable and clearly demarked from everything else you're doing is important. While that is going on, you would probably have a job and probably be working for someone. And I think there, I would just clone Warren Buffett's advice, which is you go to work for people you like, admire, and trust. So when Warren took his first job with Ben Graham and Ben Graham told him to come to New York to join him, he never asked Ben Graham what his salary is going to be. He never asked Ben Graham what his title is going to be. He just took the next train and went to New York. So basically, one of the, I would say, negative things that a lot of new grads do is they focus on the name brands. You know, it's prestigious to say that you're going to be working for Goldman Sachs and so on. Going to work for Goldman Sachs is not as important as knowing who is going to be your immediate boss and who are going to be the people you're going to work with. And if those come with a name brand, that's fine. If they come without a name brand, that's also fine. But you have to go to work with people you like, admire, and trust. And when Warren gives that criteria of like, admire, and trust, he's not asking you to go work for the company that gives you the highest offer. 
in that sentence, there's nothing about the salary. So I think you need to think about the people and the places you admire the most and reach out to those people and places to see if you can be a part of those teams. And don't worry about the comp and so the rest will take care of itself. And if you find yourself in a place where you are questioning the quality of the people, both your boss and or your colleagues, or you're questioning the ethos of the organization, you cannot really stay there. You need to move on. So that's what I would suggest. Uh, given such a monumental margin of safety you, you've outlined, so for example, buying a, uh, a business worth about $500 per share, around $75, for example, you've outlined, how often is it that you find yourself um, wrong, basically, in price predictions? And could you possibly outline a case where you were? I didn't fully get that question. Uh, are you asking that, you know, if we have a widely mispriced security, how often does that happen? Uh, yes. Yeah, so first of all, if I'm able to find one of those in a year, it's a really good year. And you don't need very many of those. So the interesting thing about the stock market is because there's 50,000 stocks, if you set a criteria saying, I'm only going to buy things that are trading at one time's earnings, you will find companies that meet that criteria. If you say that I want to buy things that are trading at, you know, 0.5 PE, six months earnings, you would find those as well. So whatever criteria you set, if you said, I, I don't want to buy anything that's more than three times earnings and I want the earnings to be very stable, you will find those as well. It is in the nature of auction-driven markets that things are not always properly priced. They can be severely underpriced and they can be severely overpriced. I remember that in the year 2000, early 2000, I had just started my fund about six months ago. And one of the guys who had invested in my fund, as I had very few investors at that time, was one of the very early employees at Microsoft. And because he was very early, he had gotten stock options and he had done really well. And he had retired and he had given me some money to manage. And he told me, listen, Monish, if you ever find yourself in Seattle, I can take you and introduce you to a bunch of Microsoft guys who are quite wealthy. And many of them may have an interest in investing with you. So I told him it was a Tuesday. I said, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be in Seattle on Thursday. So he said, okay, then I'll meet you and I'll we'll, uh, meet some people. And I went on Thursday with him to the Microsoft campus and I he introduced me to a bunch of folks he knew well. And a number of them invested with me. And I told them at that time that, listen, you guys work for a great business. But this business, Microsoft, is ridiculously overvalued. And not only, because I asked them about the situation, I said, not only is your livelihood coming from here, something like 90% of your net worth is in Microsoft stock and options. And that seems to me quite a dangerous place to be. And they told me, listen, uh, Monish, you know, you're a value investor. You really don't understand technology and you don't understand Microsoft. The stock only goes up it doesn't go down and the sky is the limit for the company. And Microsoft was trading at such a nosebleed valuation. I think it was 600 billion market cap at the time with single digit billions in earnings, it's trading at like, you know, 70, 80 times trailing earnings. And uh, from 2000 till 2013 or so, or 13 or 14, the return on the stock was zero. Now the company did extremely well. And it grew a lot in that period. But not only were the returns zero, it was a very rough ride, including a drop of like more than 70% of the stock from top to bottom. It had been really, really hard to hold that stock for the 13, 14 years. So many of those insiders lived through that suffering. So if that was a case of a very overvalued business. It was an exceptional business. It still is an exceptional business. But, you know, everything at the price. So just like things can overshoot in spectacular ways, things can also undershoot in spectacular ways. And our job, like, you know, Charlie says, or used to say, why should it be easy to get rich? So yes, there are lots of undervalued securities. Why should it be easy to find them? If you enjoy the treasure hunt and you're singularly focused on it, you will find them. These books that were written in India maybe two or 3,000 years ago, the Upanishads. And one verse from the Upanishads, which I'll just quote, is, as is your wish, so is your will. As is your will, so is your deed. 
as is your deed, so is your destiny. And then it continues on to say, your deepest desire is your destiny. So if you're really passionate about finding 10 baggers or 100 baggers or 50 baggers, and that becomes your most intense singular pursuit in life, it will happen. Your deepest desire is your destiny. The only question is, what is your deepest desire going to be? Well, going back 25 years ago, uh, when you founded Provide Investment Funds, I would like to know more about your experience of your approach to having a successful initial fundraising road and if there were any challenges or concerns that you had that you had could have made better at this point. If you can expand on that, how you attracted the attention of investors. It is extremely simple. Warren Buffett says if you deliver above average returns, above market returns, they will swim to you in shark infested waters in the middle of the Atlantic to invest with you. You can be a leper and they will invest with you. You can be obnoxious and they will invest with you. You can be the worst salesman in the world and they will invest with you if you deliver above average returns. So I had read this note by Warren Buffett from 1999 till 2007, Fabry funds did not have a single down year the first eight or nine years. And before fees, we delivered about 35 or 36% a year on average in the first eight years. After fees, it was high 20s. And I started with 1 million. And in 2007, it was north of 600 million. They found me. I didn't have to do anything. They swam through shark-infested waters to invest with me. I told my investors and I told my potential investors, I'm not available to talk to you. I'm not available to have meetings with you if you want to invest with me. You have our audited annual reports. You have my letters to partners. You have access to our website. If it works for you, you can invest. I did not do any sales type activity, meeting people and schmoozing them or any of that, because I wanted to test the theory. And I can just tell you the theory works. So all you need to do is put your nose to the grindstone and beat the market and they will find you. Hi, Monish. Uh, I was just wondering what your approach to risk is. Do you focus exclusively on the, on the micro and sort of the business model? I know in the past you've brought up uh, sort of a company that was uh, operating near uh, your airport that got uh, swept up by Uber, even though it had great fundamentals. So I was just wondering, should we even consider interest rates in the equation or is it exclusively company specific? You know, I, I try to run a 10 stock portfolio and when I, when I make a bet, I try to make a 10% bet. John Templeton said that even the best analysts will be wrong at least one out of three times. So if the best analyst is going to be wrong one out of three times, probably half my portfolio is not going, going to do what I expect it to do. So if I had invested in that parking business near LA airport, Wally Park, and if subsequently it got blown out by Uber, it's a 10% bet. And I've had 10% bets go to zero. And like Elton said, I'm still standing. So it's okay. I'm still standing. It's a great song, by the way. And that was a great movie, by the way, too. Rocket Man. What a great actor and what a great movie. Yeah. Um, so earlier when you were talking about your Ferrari position, you mentioned that uh, you've learned to appreciate holding assets when they're at fair value or maybe even above. So I was wondering, how do you rationalize that? How does it fit into your you know, value investing philosophy? And more broadly, how do you think about closing your positions? Yeah, so we want to hold great businesses, certainly when they're fairly valued. We also want to hold them when they're overvalued, if we bought them at a much lower price. And we don't want to hold them when they're egregiously overvalued, kind of like the Microsoft situation. So there is overvalued and egregiously overvalued. When things get egregious, we need to do something. But there's a huge gap between overvalued and egregiously overvalued. So one of the reasons why we want to give the business that type of rope is that we don't really know what the real intrinsic value of a business is. We may have some estimate of it. And 
good businesses or great businesses will surprise to the upside. So for example, you know, Amazon morphs into web services, Microsoft morphs into a leader in AI and, you know, Google buys YouTube, you know, and these are home runs. And Google buys Android, and that's a home run too. So when you have great management teams and you have great moats, they can do things which can surprise to the upside. So you need to leave enough leeway. On the on the other side, how many times in your lifetime do you need a hundred bag to get incredibly wealthy? So if it happens early in your life, then that hundred bagger may not have the impact that you need. So in 1995, when I had a liquid net worth of maybe a million dollars, and then I owned a business which was illiquid, which was maybe worth a few million dollars at that time. From that million dollar portfolio, I ended up with two 100 baggers. One of them was only a $10,000 bet. So it was a 1% bet. And it ended up becoming, the 10,000 ended up becoming close to a million and a half. It was almost a 150 bag, 140, 150 bag. The other one was a $100,000 bet, 10% bet. And that ended up becoming about 10 million. And the entire portfolio, the rest of it, you know, when I put it all together, it became like maybe 14 million or something, you know. So, but these two positions were 11 and a half out of that 14. Million. So they were very significant. And basically, at that point, even if I didn't have my business and so on, I could have hung up my boots and retired, right? So basically, it was really 100 bagger on a million dollar base with 100,000 investment that gave me financial independence. So you don't need to be right many times. And so when you find yourself, I mean, so to go back to the Ferrari example, Ferrari is a very unusual business. It took me a while to understand that. But 20 or 30 years from now, I would expect the moat of Ferrari to be wider and deeper than it is today. The rich are getting richer. And rich men, as opposed to rich women, have very few ways in which they can express their wealth. What can a rich man do with his wealth? I mean, the Hermes ties are not going to move the needle. But a collection of 20 Ferraris that might get some of them excited, you know. And what can a rich man do? If there's a rich guy who has 100 million, 200 million or 500 million, what can he do to express his wealth? One of the best ways is to buy a Ferrari. So Ferrari will be able to sell cars at 90% margins. There will be cars that they will produce which will be sold for 5 million by Ferrari, where the cost to Ferrari to produce the car is less than 400,000. And they might produce 200 of those. And they'll be sold out five minutes after they announce them because rich men have no other ways to express their wealth. So it's an incredible moat. And so when I look at Ferrari, you know, at the time I made the investment, it was a one and a half or two billion market cap. It's like, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 billion now. I haven't kept in touch. It's like about a 20, 30 bagger already on a significant base you know i owned when it was one and a half billion it was about a 15 20 million dollar investment in ferrari 20 million dollar investment in ferrari in 2012 if at some point it's a hundred bagger is two billion dollars you're not going to get that very many times so when you find yourself in the happy position of the ownership of such a great business you just stick it into the bottom drawer and forget about it that's it Plenty more questions, but I am worried that we are reaching the end of the session. Would, would you like to say one, one more question or should we wrap it up? Okay. We can do another question. Yeah, go on then. Okay, so we're living in a time where technology is growing really fast and obviously the traditional area of value investing, you know, reading through the 10Ks, that seems to be these expert calls on its own can be replaced by large language models and AI. Um, how much do you believe that public information gap is kind of closing? And how does this kind of affect the you know, realm of value investing? And do you believe that future track record of such individuals and BT mark averages are more largely attributed to skills? Or is it more luck or maybe insider information? Probably information is kind of closing that. We have had a, a transition with technology over the last several decades where information that used to take days or weeks to pull together can be pulled together in you know, minutes or seconds. It's speeded up a lot more. The nature of investing is that 
it's part art, part science. And AI is very powerful. And I think AI can maybe help a fair bit, but I'm not sure it can get all the way to, you know, kind of understanding the moat of a Coca-Cola, the moat of a Ferrari, because it has a lot of subtle nuances that come into play. So I think they will all, the other thing about investing to keep in mind is that when someone is a really good investor and they have small amounts of capital that they're working with, Let's say someone is an exceptional investor. They have $5 million that they have under management. Their universe is very large. They can invest in almost anything because they could make you know $500,000 bets or something. As the world finds out about them and the $5 million under management goes to $5 billion, for example, they can no longer make $500,000 bets. So they have to move up the food chain, if you will. And when they move up the food chain, the bottom of the food chain gets emptied out, which means that that space becomes available to new, new entrants who can only make $500,000 bets. So the nature of investing is that the very smart brain power that is initially at work at very small nooks and crannies of the market, by definition, that brain power will move away from those nooks and crannies because they'll get successful and they'll move into larger, greener pastures, larger pastures. So value investing has this kind of notion where continuously the bottom is being emptied out for the next generation to come in. So for all of you, if you have small amounts of capital at your disposal, you have a huge advantage. And I would think that as long as you're Maybe you can deploy AI to, you know, give you some speed. But I think at the end of the day, I don't think there is really a substitute for the deep dive and really kind of understanding things because so much of it is non-quantitative and so much of it is, it changes so much from one company to the next. Uh, the circle of competence comes in a big way. So there's many factors that come in in trying to figure out whether, you know, something can work or not. When I was last year, I was studying the coal industry. I spent seven months only reading and studying coal. I went underground, more than 200 stories underground into four different coal mines. I spent probably about 10 days with coal miners in the coal mines, in the coal terminals. And I'm still continuing to do that. And uh, I think after seven months, I don't know the industry that well. So the people with ADD who want it on a platter in an hour or 15 minutes, good luck. At the end of that, a huge, huge thanks to Rich for coming along. I know you can't see many faces, but everyone seems to very much enjoy the questions, the answers provided to our questions. It's hugely insightful as always. And yeah, yeah, I guess we hope you enjoyed the event as well. All right. Well, thank you very much. It was very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you.